Good morning. My name is Jean Nagelkirk, and I'm the Vice Provost for Health at Grand Valley State University. On behalf of the Health Forum of West Michigan Planning Partners, which includes Grand Valley State University, Michigan State University College of Human Medicine, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, the Midwest Interprofessional Practice Education Research Center, and the Michigan Center for Clinical Improvement. Welcome to today's event titled the COVID-19 vaccination. Nearly 34 million doses of Pfizer and Moderna vaccine has been administered in the United States. That's nearly 8 million more than just a week ago. This is good news, but we have more work ahead of us in getting as many shots in individuals in their arms as possible. Through the West Michigan Vaccine Collaborative, which includes our healthcare organizations, county health departments, and other healthcare systems, not only have they provided great COVID care for our community, they are now working to give individuals vaccines, which are much needed. Many questions are emerging about vaccine effectiveness against the new variants in the United Kingdom, Brazil, and South Africa. Questions are arising such as, what are the potential long-term side effects of Pfizer or Moderna vaccine? Once I get a vaccine, am I safe from getting COVID? When will we reach herd immunity? Our expert panelists will share information about these questions, as well as information about the state's vaccine plan, distribution and resources, the tight safety side effect profile and efficacy of the vaccines, as well as provide an update on vaccine distribution on each of the health systems. Before we begin our presentation, I'd like to thank Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan for sponsoring this event, as well as the entire series this year. I'd like to thank Diane Dykstra, our event coordinator, for planning these programs. Also, please mark your calendar for our next health forum in our virtual series for Friday, March 5th, which will be on the impact of COVID-19 on education. Now I have the privilege of introducing today's moderator, Dr. Norelli Vora. Dr. Vora is a family medicine physician and medical director at the Kent County Health Department. She earned her medical degree at the University of Michigan and completed her residency training in Rhode Island at Brown Family Medicine Residency Program. Dr. Bora provides care for patients at the Navajo Reservation in Shiprock, New Mexico. She has been practicing in Grand Rapids since 2013, caring for patients and serving as a faculty member. Norelli is currently enrolled in a master's program in public health at John Hopkins University. She is passionate about health equity, listening to people's stories, and working together to improve the well being of our community. Dr. Bora. Thank you, Dr. Nagelkirk, for that introduction and for inviting me to be a part of this forum. As you know, the world has been battling this pandemic for a year. Last month marked the anniversary of the first case of COVID-19 in the United States. This pandemic has affected each of us, perhaps in our physical health, our mental health, our financial well-being, and in our ability to spend time with those we love. There has been too much loss and more grief than we could have imagined. In this past year, we've learned many lessons. We have seen that some communities were more impacted by COVID-19 than others. We've also learned that when we take actions to protect others and ourselves, when we wear masks and keep our distance, that we can reduce the spread of this virus. We've learned that when we come together as a community to help those who have been the hardest hit, we make a difference. Over the past week, we've averaged 100 new cases per seven days. This is lower than anything we've seen since October of last year. The arrival of vaccines brings hope in saving lives, preventing illness, and in bringing an end to this pandemic. Since the end of December, nearly 10% of adults in Kent County have received a vaccine to protect against COVID-19. While this is an encouraging start, we have a long ways to go. We judge ourselves by how quickly we can vaccinate people, but also in how well we reach those communities that have been disproportionately affected by COVID and those who have challenges in accessing larger vaccination sites, whether that's because of mobility, a disability, or trust in the healthcare system, or trust in the vaccine. We have an excellent panel of speakers joining us today. Before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to provide an outline of this event. 
Each panelist will present for 10 to 12 minutes. At the conclusion of the four presentations, we'll then bring our panelists back to the stage for an approximately 30 to 40 minute joint Q&A. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Natasha Bagdasarian earned a Master of Public Health in Molecular Epidemiology and completed her Internal Medicine Residency and Infectious Disease Fellowship at the University of Michigan. Dr. Bagdasarian consults for the World Health Organization on International Outbreak Preparedness and Response. Since July of 2020, she has served as Senior Public Health Physician at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, where she provides input on communicable diseases, outbreak and pandemic response, and public health policy. Dr. Bagdasarian has numerous peer-reviewed publications in the field of infectious diseases and epidemiology, including several publications of COVID-19. I just want to um, start out by saying that the vaccines have been through phase one, phase two, and phase three trials, just as any other vaccine in the past has been through. The process has been sped up, um, but the vaccines were um, tested in hundreds of thousands of people and now have been administered to millions of individuals. Um, so we have excellent data on safety and efficacy. The two vaccines which are being distributed um, through the state of Michigan, as well as through the, the rest of the United States um, are the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. Um, both of them utilize the same technology. They are both mRNA vaccines and both require two doses. Both are up to 95% effective. The biggest difference is in how these vaccines are stored and handled. Um, so the Pfizer vaccine has to be stored at ultra cool temperatures and the Moderna vaccine has to be stored at merely cold temperatures. Um, Pfizer has been approved for ages 16 and up and Moderna has been approved for ages 18 and up. And there's a little bit of a difference in terms of when the second doses are recommended, um, but very, very similar, uh, both of these vaccines. Also similar in some of the side effects that have been reported. Um, and I can tell you that I received my second dose of the Pfizer vaccine on Wednesday. Um, and I did have a little bit of pain at the site of injection and fatigue, but otherwise um, no major issues. Um, there are people reporting um, some of these issues after the second dose and saying that they um, uh, felt uh, pretty terrible after the second dose. Um, however, I, I just wanna say that from an immunological perspective, um, this is just evidence that the vaccine is working and that people's immune responses are ramping up. I won't go into the details of how the mRNA vaccines work because I know that one of our other speakers will be talking about some of these details, but I have to say that the technology is simply wonderful and has been built on uh, years and years of research. So this is not something that was um, discovered uh, when we first heard of uh, COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This is something that has been um, being worked on for many, many years. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the state's approach to distribution and how we are um, handling the different phases and this very uh, targeted rollout of vaccine. So phase 1A was for healthcare providers and long-term care facility residents. And those populations were really put at the forefront of vaccination for a couple of reasons. Number one, we know that long-term care facilities are where we have seen the majority of our outbreaks and deaths. And then healthcare providers, um, we know that hospitals have been overwhelmed, that there have been staffing shortages, and our goal is to keep healthcare infrastructure open, not just for care of COVID patients, but also care for anyone else who needs medical assistance. So people having heart attacks or strokes need to be able to access the health healthcare um, infrastructure. And that was the reason why phase 1A was targeted the way that it was. Phase 1B is for essential workers. And these are for individuals who have been going into work throughout the pandemic. So um, people working in food and agriculture, police, firefighters. Um, we've also uh, made this available to uh, education because we know that these are industries that we are doing our best to keep open. And then phase 1C is for adults with high risk medical conditions and adults over the age of 65. Um, and so this was the way that the vaccine rollout was planned in a very targeted way to protect the most vulnerable uh, individuals in society, but also to keep the most uh, critical and vulnerable sectors of society open and moving. 
The guiding principles in our vaccine rollout is for all Michiganders to have equitable access to vaccines. Um, so not just equal, but equitable, because we know that some areas have been hardest hit by COVID-19. We want to make sure that vaccine planning and distribution is inclusive, and we've been really engaging um, public and private partners, local health departments, and leaders from marginalized groups. We want to make sure that communications are transparent and that data is available for anyone who's interested in seeing how vaccine rollout is going. The goals are for at least 70% of Michiganders ages 16 and up to be vaccinated as quickly as possible. And even though we've got 70% up here, um, the, the end goal is just to get as many people vaccinated as we can. The um, idea that we're trying to reach herd immunity, and a lot of people have been hearing about herd immunity in the news, um, seems to be a little bit of um, a moving target for those of you who've been following um, comments by leaders like Dr. Fauci and others. And it's simply because we don't really know um, what will happen with um, different variants of the virus being more transmissible um, and um, what it will really take to get us to a place where we can start rolling back some of our mitigation measures. So the goal is to get as many people vaccinated as we can to prevent some of these large scale outbreaks. We want to make sure that doses that are received are administered within seven days of arrival. So again, we want to get doses in arms as quickly as possible and also to make sure that 95% of individuals are getting their second dose of vaccine within the expected time frame. So these are our goals. And we also want to achieve no disparity in vaccination rates across racial and ethnic groups. Uh, by social vulnerability index, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means. And we also want to make sure that vaccines are available in sites where people are living and working so that you're not having to travel huge distances to get vaccine. The social vulnerability index is a tool that we've been using to identify um, communities who are at higher risk of um, COVID-19 and just uh, poor healthcare outcomes. And these include socioeconomic status, family composition and disability, minority status and language minority, housing type and transportation. So these are all the things that are going into the equation of how to get vaccines to deliver to people in an equitable way. And I'll share a little bit of data from our COVID dashboard. So I'd mentioned before that we want to make sure that data is available and that things are being done in a very transparent way. So this is publicly available data from our COVID uh, vaccine website that shows you how many doses have been administered. This number keeps changing. So I think I pulled this um, data uh, more than 24 hours ago, and I'm sure the number has gone up since then, and you can see over time um, how our numbers of doses have gone up by first dose and by second dose. So it's, it's really been a beautiful thing watching this rollout and watching uh, more and more vaccines go into arms, but uh, we want to make sure that this is being done in a way that preserves um, equity and dignity um, of our residents around the state. I've got a couple of resources here. So this is the uh, Michigan, the MDHHS COVID vaccine website. If you're interested in looking at some of that data, and there's also a button on here that allows you to identify sites in your community that are offering the vaccine. And we've also got the number for the COVID hotline down here. Um, for those of you who are interested in um, getting the vaccine to friends and family who may not have internet access, you can also refer them to 211. They can call 211 to find out where there are sites in their area. Um, I will just end by saying this vaccine or, or these vaccines are our exit ramp um, out of this pandemic. These are the best chance we have to reaching a place of herd immunity, a place where we no longer are having large scale spread in the community of COVID-19. Um, and they allow us to protect the most vulnerable among us. There are still details that are being worked out. So how long will immunity last? Will we need booster doses? Uh, will the vaccine need to be tweaked in the future? So all of these are being worked out. Um, and when we can scale back on our mitigation factors, that's also something that we're still discussing and looking at. For now, I encourage you to continue on with the mitigation strategies, which mean wearing a mask, social distancing, washing your hands, 
not uh, participating in large gatherings. And also, when you are eligible for a vaccine, um, please do uh, take that vaccine opportunity at your um, earliest opportunity. This is our best shot for um, getting life closer to uh, normal pre-pandemic days and, and also protecting the most vulnerable in our communities. Thank you so much. And I'll hand back over to Dr. Bora. Thank you so much, Dr. Bagdasarian. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Andrew Jamison. Andrew Jamison is an infectious disease physician at Mercy Health St. Mary's. He was trained at Wayne State University and Michigan State University and completed a fellowship at the University of Michigan. He specializes in HIV medicine, transplant infections, and has an interest in atypical mycobacterial diseases. He was tasked to be one of the infectious disease physicians participating in statewide and national committees for Trinity Health's COVID-19 response. He's active in medical education with teaching at the undergraduate medical education level, resident level, and fellow training. He's an assistant professor of medicine, acting as a clerkship director for MSU's Grand Rapids Internal Medicine Rotation. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation to be here today, everyone. So I'm going to try to pick up right where Dr. Bagdasarian left off. One thing I want to mention uh, to pick up on what Dr. Bagdasarian said is that uh, this is definitely a, one of the fastest rollouts of vaccination we've ever had. But we've also never been vaccinating or trying to do a trial in the middle of a pandemic. And one of the things you need in a, in a vaccine trial is to be able to show the difference between unvaccinated people and vaccinated people. Um, and it's really nice to see uh, a use that came out of so many people being infected uh, because the vaccine trials originally were planning on uh, taking nine to 18 months to get going. Um, but because of how many people, unfortunately, were infected in our country, we've hit our endpoints really, really quickly. So uh, that's just a, a side note that people don't always think about when they think about how fast trials went forward. So I just want to do a quick framework and say, why is this important? And we all know this. Uh, I don't think this is a surprise to any of this. But this is something called... Um, uh, excess mortality. So our country has a lot of data going back decades saying how many people each month pass away in the United States. And it's a very, very standard number. Um, we know exactly how many people should pass away. And when we start seeing signal about people passing away well above that threshold, uh, it really starts to worry us. So uh, you can see here on this far right, uh, all those blue bars are basically the months since uh, COVID-19 has started uh, in the United States. And since that early time, we have been consistently above uh, our threshold for excess mortality in a way that we have only seen a couple times in the past related to really bad flu pandemics. And so since February of 2020, there's been 450,000 uh, excess deaths uh, in the United States. Some of those are attributed to COVID. Some of them are attributed to lack of access because of COVID. Uh, but uh, this is a big deal and it's really hurting our country. So vaccines are a great way to get to the end of this. So the, we do have quite a few different vaccination types. Uh, the mRNA vaccine is the one that is out in, and uh, approved under emergency youth authorization right now, but we're gonna touch real briefly on these other ones as well. So messenger RNA vaccines uh, are very <coughs> elegant. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, there's very little extra material in these. There is a little piece of genetic code. There is a little piece of uh, lipid. Um, there's a couple other components in it, but in terms of medic medications or vaccines, there's very little in it, which is which decreases the chance of allergy, decreases the chance of bad reactions. Um, so what we do is we inject a very small portion of this genetic code into an individual. This genetic code gets taken up by a cell, and then what happens is your own body's uh, internal uh, kind of protein manufacturing starts up and actually makes a small piece of the coronavirus called the spike protein. And that spike protein is what our body responds to and then ultimately develops an immune response to so that if it ever sees that spike protein again, it is ready to respond and prevent an infection. Um, right now we have three different vaccines available and uh, Dr. Bagdasarian touched on a couple of these. The Pfizer and Moderna are both uh, available right now. We've been using them for a while. Um, the other one that's going is actually out of Germany called CureVac. Um, and this is the other mRNA vaccine that is going to be uh, available in the world. And we're anticipating getting more data on this coming soon. Now, 
there's also these vector vaccines. And these are things that basic, basically what we do is we try to package them in a way that made them more stable. This allows these vector vaccines to not require any freezing. Um, a lot of times they can be shelf stable for a really long time. Some of them don't even need uh, really great refrigeration for a long time. So that will give us a huge leg up um, as we try to expand this around the world. So this one, we actually put a little bit of DNA inside an adenovirus that is made uh, so that it cannot actually cause infection. An adenovirus is a cold virus that we've had for a long time. Um, this actually allows our cells to take up that whole adenovirus and then it basically takes one step backwards um, in that uh, process of manufacturing a spike protein. So it takes the DNA, turns the DNA of the, of the spike protein into RNA, and then ultimately makes spike protein, which does the exact same thing as uh, the mRNA vaccines. So uh, this one, there's actually uh, quite a few that are coming out. So Sputnik 5 is the one that came out of Russia. Uh, this one uses uh, a, a two different vectors, actually. A first dose vector is one adenovirus, and they switched it up to give a second dose ve vector so that your immune system kind of has a chance to kind of get stirred up by a different vector. Um, uh, the latest data that just came out out of Russia actually was pretty reassuring. Early on, there wasn't a lot of sharing of data, and so there was some hesitance to really buy into it. Uh, the latest data is very reassuring, and this vaccine is actually getting distributed worldwide uh, in many different regions. AstraZeneca is the one uh, that is marketed under the name of Covashield uh, in India. This has been approved in a lot of U UK countries as well as uh, in India. The efficacy actually differs a little bit. So it depends on what uh, dose of the vaccine you get first. Now, there's lots of nuances with this, but this is one that uh, we're getting more and more information about. Uh, and a bunch of uh, data just got published from them uh, recently. And overall, it was, it was relatively reassuring. And then Johnson & Johnson just approved, just uh, applied for emergency youth authorization, I think yesterday actually. Um, and so this is the single dose vaccine that they asked for approval on, although um, they did start up a phase three trial for a double dose option of this back in the end of November. Um, the One of the big uh, exciting things to state is that in these vaccine trials, the number of hospitalized individuals that got the vaccine and then unfortunately were in that small percentage that got COVID, uh, they didn't get hospitalized and they didn't die. So uh, these are very effective, even if they're not perfect at stopping the actual uh, infection itself. We also have a few things called protein-based vaccines where we actually are just injecting the spike protein itself. This one is a little bit cool and I thought we would just talk briefly about it. Uh, this is a something called, uh, uh, they, we actually infect a moth cell um, with something called a baculovirus. We then harvest protein from that uh, moth cell. This moth cell makes a ton of protein. We actually harvest it and then we make it into a tiny little particle that is just spike protein. So no extra uh, material, no extra um, infections, no extra bacteria or viruses. Uh, it's just this little protein there. And then we give it with a a, a something called an adjuvant that kind of stirs up the immune system. And then we basically do the exact same thing. We get ready to see it again. And this one actually uses something from the soap bark tree uh, to stir up our immune system. And this comes out of Chile uh, and it's a naturally occurring compound that really helps get your immune system up and running. This is called Novavax. Um, uh, this one probably is gonna be up and running uh, and is pretty far along in its phase three trials right now, which is great. Um, and then there's a different one out of Russia that we don't know much data about. This is also a protein based. And the last thing I just want to mention is we do have a couple vaccines out of China that are um, that are being utilized that come from inactivated viruses. And so that basically is taking coronavirus, making it so it cannot make you sick, and then uh, giving that whole coronavirus to people to respond to. Now, the other thing that I want to touch upon briefly um, is the different uh, variants that you guys have heard about uh, that have kind of come up. Uh, the place where variants emerge is when uh, you have a lot of infection, because every time uh, any virus, but particularly SARS-CoV-2, replicates and changes, it has a, a chance at making a mistake in that replication. And every time it makes a mistake, it has a chance of mutating slightly. And then if that mutation actually gives it a benefit against other coronaviruses, it starts to emerge as a primary variant and then really starts to take hold. 
And so we first heard about this out of the UK in, uh, in September of 2020. Uh, this is the B.1.7 uh, variant. Um, this has an increase in ability to spread. So we think it spreads about 50% more likely or easily, um, which, uh, which is definitely a big concern. Um, we're not totally sure if there's an increase in mortality or danger. Um, out of the UK, there is some early data that maybe it actually was making people a little bit more sick, or it was just because there were so many numbers that were coming in because of this variant. Um, the good news is the current vaccines that we're producing uh, that are mRNAs are uh, protective against this variant. Um, so really, we're in a race against this variant uh, with the vaccination efforts. And the fact that we are, you know, we're over a million people getting vaccinated a day over the last week, um, it's a really big deal to kind of make a difference for this. The one thing I would say um, about these uh, about these variants is that even if the even if you don't get more sick from them, if you now infect 20 or 200 people instead of 100 people, what you end up getting is a lot more people hospitalized just from a proportional standpoint. So the worry from the health standpoint, from the public health standpoint, from the hospitals is that we'll just get uh, overwhelmed. And so we are very, very nervous about these and watching these things. And our Bureau of Laboratories at the State Health Department is doing surveillance for this regularly. So um, we, our, our routine COVID-19 tests will pick up these variants, but they won't identify them as variants. So if you get a COVID test, you have no way of knowing if it's a variant that you have unless it gets tested with a gene study at the central level at the state. Um, there are a few other reference labs doing it and some universities as well, but our Bureau of Laboratories really has a nice way of getting specimens to them and then looking for this variant. The B1.351 uh, uh, variant is a South African variant. Um, this is also more infectious, um, and, but the concern about this one is that there's actually less protection from the vaccines that we have. Um, we know that the, the um, Johnson & Johnson trial had a big arm in South Africa, and they noticed a much lower overall efficacy in South Africa because many of these were caused by the variant. Um, there is no more evidence of severe disease here, um, but, but this is also in the United States and we're watching this closely. The final one is a, a P1 variant. This is pretty early on. Um, we think, again, this is less protection from the vaccine and less protection against uh, previous COVID. Um, these are the overall numbers uh, that we have in the United States as of yesterday. Um, uh, Michigan has quite a few of them. And last night there was a report about a variant, the B117 out of uh, Kalamazoo County, which is the first time it's come out of Southeast Michigan. The last thing I just want to um, we've been a part of it. We've really partnered and tried to partner with uh, Spectrum Metro and Kent County Health Department to really get out and vaccinate our teachers and law enforcements. We've had lots of challenges like everyone else. Um, matching delivery with demand, ensuring equitability and justice and vaccination is huge. Um, we have two sites we're running right now, a drive-through vaccination and a parking garage. We actually retrofitted a parking garage, uh, made it climate controlled, open and shut, people pull in, get vaccinated, sit there and then move on. Um, uh, I love this banner at the end. May your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. I think it's a big one. Um, and then we have a Kentwood site as well uh, that we are able to get quite a few people through. So I appreciate the opportunity of talking and I'll turn it back over, Dr. Bora. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Jameson. And next we have um, Pete Haverkamp. Um, so Pete Haverkamp is the Director of Pharmacy for Metro Health, University of Michigan Health. Mr. Haverkamp gained his pharmacy degree from Ferris State University, where he continues to serve as an adjunct instructor for clinical pharmacy. He has also held leadership positions with Lapeer Regional Medical Center, McLaren Health System, and Memorial Healthcare. Mr. Haverkamp has presented at numerous national and international conferences. He's also published articles in the publication Pharmacy Purchasing and Products and has been featured in US News and World Report for medication safety practices and hospital pharmacy. He currently serves on the Epic Systems National Pharmacy Advisory Board. All right, well, good morning, everybody, and um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with everybody today and for uh, to be a member of this panel. Um, it's wonderful to get a chance to um, share information about the, the vaccines and to share a little bit about uh, kind of some of the infrastructure associated with how we get these vaccines over um, to our patients and, and deliver them through our, our hospital setting. And also I'll cover a little bit today about uh, some of the uh, special considerations and side effects. So I'm going to start to share my screen here.
So one of the things, as you can imagine, as you've heard with some of the storage conditions, and it's been reported pretty widely throughout the news, um, that the Pfizer vaccine, and I'm going to focus on that one a little bit, just because it has some of the more unusual storage requirements for a product that we've had in some time. And, and uh, there's a lot of infrastructure in place, both from the manufacturer, uh, the, shipper, the shipping containers, the transportation companies, and a lot of innovation that has really been created to um, help get this vaccine uh, to into the patient's arms, um, and so that it's uh, uh, maintains its effectiveness throughout the entire transportation chain. Um, we uh, this this vaccine, as you've heard, uh, requires ultra low um, storage to keep it frozen, so that the protein remains uh, stable during transport. Um, and there are two ways that we can do that, and we receive the product um, from the. Uh, um, from Pfizer um, in a special thermal container, uh, which uh, helps to ensure that the product remains um, at ultra cold temperatures. And these temperatures are um, in the minus 90 to minus 60 degrees Celsius or in Fahrenheit, uh, minus 130 to minus 100 and, or to minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that's cold enough to, to keep dry ice frozen, uh, to give you some idea about how cold we have to maintain to keep these vaccines uh, stable during transport. And you can see here on the slide the um, actual design of the thermal shipper that's been created to ensure that these vaccines get to us in the right temperature range. Um, you've also probably heard and seen news reports of um, some uh, failures in the supply chain to get the, the product to us, but those are rare, luckily. Um, and I've been very impressed with the uh, connections from the state of Michigan through Pfizer itself and communications um, about uh, how do we keep these vaccines stable during transport. But as you can see here, there's an insulated shipping box that also has an interior core that holds the actual trays, which are the, the, the letter B here in the diagram. And then uh, surrounding the entire assembly is a uh, package of containing pelletized uh, dry ice, which helps to maintain that temperature. Um, so these shippers um, are one way for uh, locations that either do not have ultra cold uh, refrigeration uh, capabilities at their site, um, or they can be used to transfer product uh, from these uh, thermal shippers into an ultra cold uh, refrigerator. Uh, but there are some quick timing on it to that uh, to assure that, that we, uh, again, make sure that these vaccines remain in optimized storage conditions. So as soon as that thermal shipper is received, we need to transfer it into an ultra cold uh, container if possible within 24 uh, immediately, um, or the, the dry ice that it was originally shipped in the container needs to be replenished within 24 hours. Um, they need to keep that, if they're going to keep it in the uh, thermal shipper, it needs to be restocked with dry ice and checked twice a day. Um, they want to make sure that the opening and closing of that thermal shipper, if the vaccine is stored in that in that product and that shipper, um, needs to be open less than every within three minutes, and then every five days it needs to be uh, re-iced with dry ice to make sure that again we can uh, keep it uh, keep it at the right temperature until we need to thaw it and get it ready for use. So just about a couple of facts about dry ice and you know what what is that you know you've probably heard about it, it is actually the frozen form of carbon dioxide and it has some special uh, risks associated with it as well. Um, as you can imagine, it's extremely cold, so we need to make sure that all staff have had uh, special training uh, to make sure that they have appropriate uh, personal protective equipment. Um, including uh, special gloves uh, that uh, protect our hands from the handling the dry ice uh, that are waterproof. Also face shields to make sure that as we're opening and you can see here in the shipper, the dry ice kind of pellets around it as we try to remove these from the shipping containers, there is a chance that those pellets can kind of bump around and jump up at us. Um, and so we wanna make sure that it doesn't actually come in contact with um, our eyes or with our face or with our hands. Uh, again, there's also a risk with dry ice uh, because it, it is one of the substances that uh, sublimates, which means it goes right from a frozen state back to a gas state. It does not actually pass into a liquid state whatsoever. Um, and so there's a risk as, it, as the temperatures warm and we open up the container, especially if the dry ice is in an enclosed space um, or put into a sealed container that that can cause concerns for either asphyxiation, um, you know, suffocation, or that uh, if it's in an enclosed container, 
container that the actual pressure as that dry ice turns back into a gas uh, can build pressure and actually create explosions. So again, our staff has gone through CDC approved training to make sure that we understand how to appropriately and safely transfer product from these containers. Um, and then at once the vaccine is into our ultra cold uh, storage is that that dry ice is then taken care of safely. Um, so some of the key things that we uh, taught, uh, teach staff and again associated with the CDC based training is it's important not to touch that dry ice, um, avoid eye contact or whatever. Obviously, we'd never want it to eat dry ice. Um, and the reason that's stated, it sounds obvious, but people have, you've seen uh, probably on TV where people or, or on shows where they'll took dry ice into a um, into some, some water and it may create what looks like uh, smoke. Um, that's extremely dangerous. If you happen to actually ingest the dry ice, it could be uh, definitely cause potential ulcerations. Uh, we don't want it to be stored in con confined spaces, again, where the risk again for uh, asphyxiation would happen and we don't want to put it in an airtight container. So just to give you an example of a view of kind of some of the infrastructure in place in most hospitals, um, this center one here is a picture of what our ultra cold um, freezer looks like here at the Metro Health University of Michigan Health. And we have two of those, one primary and one secondary. Uh, these devices are on 24 seven, uh, 365 emergency backup power so that if there's any failures, uh, we can emergency switch back over. And then we also have a backup device. So again, because of the criticalities vaccines and the absolute scarcity, we wanna make sure that um, our, our infrastructure has appropriate precautions in place to protect the vaccines. Then as we move them from um, and thaw them to get them ready to actually be administered, they get transferred into a regular a medical grade refrigerator, which maintains very tight control. Um, and then there are actual transport cubes that help to get actually transport vaccine from the refrigerator up to the clinic locations. These also have digital probes to ensure that the temperature remains uh, consistent within the appropriate ranges. And then again, clinic-based vaccine refrigerators that are again, help make sure that that, temp, that that vaccine is absolutely in the primus condition it can be when before it actually gets ready to be administered. Um, so there are also controls regarding how long those trays of vaccine can be available. Um, so they must be kept uh, at ultra cold frozen temperatures all the way up until we are ready to use them because once you move them um, from the, the ultra cold into the regular refri refrigeration, we have limited amounts of time that uh, we can, uh, before the vaccine will no longer be good. Uh, so once it's been transferred um, over to uh, the regular refrigeration, uh, we have 120 hours or five days to use that vaccine. And then once it's been diluted, we and it's raised to room temperature, we have actually six hours to use that vaccine. So these supply chains are absolutely critical in making sure that uh, the vaccine does not go to waste. Um, and that we appropriately keep them in the, the correct temperature ranges. And you can see there a picture again of one of the digital temperature probes that are required to assure that the vaccine remains in an appropriate form. Um, there are also um, specific instructions. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine that needs to be diluted uh, before we can actually give it. Um, and then the actual administration dose is 0.3 mLs or three tenths of a CC, you may hear it called. Um, so uh, we typically can get uh, five to six doses out of every, every vial. Um, and now the actual labeling for Pfizer has been improved to say, as we've learned with the, the vaccine, that there many times is enough in that, that vial to get us that six dose, which is great, which is, helps us to vaccinate vaccinate more people. Um, so just from a clinic design standpoint, uh, we want to make sure that the process flows well. And there are multiple different ways to approach, as you've heard from some of the other speakers this morning, including Dr. Jamison. There are drive-throughs. There are uh, physician office-based clinics. There are uh, large arena size. And I think you'll hear about another one of our speakers talk about that today. Um, we also have um, hospital-based ones. And that's what you're seeing here. Uh, basically, we need to have registration locations. We need to have um, easy flow in and out uh, to maintain social social distancing, uh, we have to have observation areas and then observe and then actual locations and exam rooms to actually give the vaccine. Um, so move on to quickly into some clinical considerations. We want to make sure that people understand that um, because we're giving a vaccine, the idea is we want to generate a immune response. So these vaccines uh, do uh, generate an immune response, which is then your body's natural reaction to, to forming protection. Uh, but they, as a result, they do um, have both localized and systemic side effects. Um, 
it is expected that about 80 to 90 percent of people will experience at least one local um, a type of uh, effect and also that um, about 55 to uh, 83 percent of people will develop at least one of the systemic effects. Now mo most of these are usually mild to moderate and will dissipate within one to three days uh, but they include um, things such as pain, swelling, redness at the injection site, localized armpit pain um, and on the same side as the vaccine arm. Some systemic effects include fever, fatigue, heart uh, headache, um, chills, muscle, and joint pain. Um, and again, the, the key message we want to pass on here are the side effects are a sign that the immune system is working and they typically go away on their own within one week. Um, so uh, as you mentioned, you, the people are concerned about this um, and what are some of the things that we can do to help minimize the actual side effects that people have. Um, so again, we want to make sure that people uh, expect that this is going to happen and that it's a sign that our body is reacting positively to the, the vaccine and starting to form long-term protection. Um, luckily, the most severe of the hypersensitivity reactions were relatively rare and similar to placebo or just slightly higher. Uh, it was not, anaphylaxis was actually not, uh, which is the most severe type of a, a, a reaction, was not observed during the actual clinical trials, but obviously as it's gone into mass use now with millions of doses, we have seen uh, some people actually develop that. Um, treatment for the uh, localized and uh, the systemic reactions include just common like Tylenol or acetaminophen, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, such as ibuprofen, and those should be taken after the vaccine has been given and help to moderate sort of the overall effect. Uh, where well, there's also been concerns about pregnancy and lactation, and while the absolute risk is low for uh, women that are, are pregnant, they do unfortunately have an increased risk if they develop COVID-19 uh, disease uh, for severe illness, including um, a trips to potentially the intensive care, uh, mechanical ventilation or death. And there's also unfortunately an increased risk for adverse events in the pregnancy, such as a preterm birth. So we really, um, in the uh, American College of uh, Obstetricians, sorry about that. Um, the American College of Obstetricians has also recommended that uh, if there's no contraindication for women that they should get the vaccine. Um, the, as we talked about, and you heard other of our speakers uh, state, the messenger RNA va vaccines uh, do not uh, degrade very quickly. Uh, they do not, uh, are not considered live vaccines, and they also are degraded very quickly by our body. Um, so we recommend that if there is a pregnant woman uh, that wants to have uh, consider the, uh, getting the vaccine, that they have a conversation with their obstetrician or their primary care physician um, and make sure that it is the right choice for them. So who should not get the vaccine? Um, there are folks that, uh, that, that, and luckily the contraindications of the vaccine are relatively uh, narrow, uh, but anybody that had a severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis to a previous dose of the vaccine should not get it. Anybody that had an immediate reaction to um, a previous dose of the vaccine or any of its components or, uh, or um, an immediate allergic reaction to any severity to polysorbate, which is one of the uh, vaccine components. Um, so again, the, these, um, Reaction types are rare um, and all the clinic locations where a patient would potentially receive the vaccine um, are prepared for these types of reactions and we have uh, emergency boxes that are pre prepared. So really, should I get the vaccine? Um, getting the vaccine, there have been concerns that people would have, um, you know, I would just get mild symptoms if I get the, the disease, um, that people may see natural infection as potentially preferable. Others may be concerned about getting the vaccine could lead to later more severe illness. Um, and those, uh, those are not true. Um, the potential serious effects of a COVID-19 infection um, post to potentially your loved ones or unvaccinated people. You could give it to your loved ones and or uh, uh, members of our community that cannot fight off the vaccine and actually could end up causing those folks to get very sick or die. Um, there's also potential that you could have long-term side effects if we were, as we are learning um, as you recover from COVID-19. So we're still learning more about the way this disease works. Um, but again, uh, uh, we, and we do not know how long the protections last, but the vac vaccines, as you've heard, um, have been tested in large clinical trials and uh, getting a COVID vaccine, we believe strongly is the safest choice. 
So quickly, I just cover a couple of few of the myths. Um, you know, we've heard that uh, some folks thought that the pneumonia and the flu vaccines protect against COVID-19. They do not. Uh, there's no evidence that uh, a saline nasal wash would help to prevent you from getting the COVID uh, uh, virus. The high temperatures or living in high temperature related areas, uh, unfortunately, has not shown to have any protection. And in fact, in some cases, has shown an increased uh, transmission rate. Again, um, for us here in low temperatures, as of today with the snow, uh, there's been no evidence that show that it can kill the, the, the virus. Antibiotics, uh, the antibiotics kill bacteria, they do not kill viruses. And again, you've probably heard of rumors regarding alcohol or chlorine sprays, again, being protective. Um, those are on the surface of our skin and these substances can also harm you um, significantly if you ingest them. So again, they do not offer any protection. Uh, so also just a couple scams to cover, um, that COVID-19 scams, you cannot pay to put your name on a list to get the vaccine, you cannot pay to get early access to the vaccine, and no one should call you to ask for your social security earning number, bank number, or credit card number. And one other rumor that we've heard, um, there are no actions from the Department of Homeland Security um, to do uh, immigration enforcement actions at any vaccine site. Uh, so quickly, facts, uh, the vaccines can cause a short fever, as we've talked about. Other reactions are rare. Uh, they do not contain a live or a whole um, microchips or tracer technologies or fetal tissue or stem cells or mercury, aluminum or luciferase, um, or they do not create the mark of the beast or uh, pork products or preservatives. Uh, there are messenger, do not change a messenger-based RNA vaccines, do not change a person's DNA and a COVID vaccine that can end up, uh, uh, and the truth is uh, a COVID vaccine can help to end this pandemic much sooner with much fewer lives lost. So I thank you. Um, and um, I'm gonna turn the, the presentation back over to Nirali. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pete. And so next we have Keith Hustack. Uh, Keith, Keith Hustack serves as the Vice President of APPs and Operations at Spectrum Health. In addition, Keith serves in operations for urgent care, occupational health, and virtual health to bring new models of care to patients and employers. During the pandemic, Keith led the development of a drive-through COVID testing tent. He's also helped organize the West Michigan Vaccine Collaborative, which brings together health departments, health systems, retail pharmacies, and universities to efficiently distribute the vaccine. Keith is a physician assistant by trade, having trained at Wayne State in Detroit and received a Master in Public Health degree from the Ohio State University. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bora. Thank you to uh, Grand Valley State University for having me. So I want to talk about my, my presentation really is focused on uh, the distribution of the vaccine. And I, I know a lot of people have a lot of questions. I'm sure all of us are getting phone calls. If you're in healthcare and you're watching this, you probably get a lot of phone calls as to uh, when am I getting the vaccine? What's taking so long, et cetera? And I'm going to try and answer some of those questions for, for you. Uh, I want to start with saying this. Um, there really are, I call it the four Ds to distribution of vaccine. So it's demand, delivery, doses, and data. And I'll kind of walk through those one more time. Demand being, what is the demand? Um, you know, we hear, hear a lot of things on social media and, and, and I, I think all of our speakers did a great job of, of, of looking at the evidence and science behind why we do vaccines and why it's important to get vaccinated. And yet we see there's still a, a, a large scrutiny from a, lot, a large contingent of folks who believe that there's something evil about vaccines. And so the, the first question is, what is the demand of vaccine? Are people actually gonna wanna get it? And, you know, I can say at least in, at Spectrum Health, you know, um, 75% of our employees are definitely on the list to get it. Um, and, and so, and, and there's been a, that overwhelming response from the, the um, community as well. So the, the demand is certainly there. Uh, delivery. Um, so you heard Pete talk about the delivery methods, you know, and, and the delivery of this vaccine, this is certainly a, a different in terms of the uh, temperamental nature of these vaccines and the temperature. And uh, so the delivery is a, is a key component of, of uh, distribution. Doses, you also heard Pete talk about, um, you know, we get vials basically, and within those vials, there could be, you know, five doses, there could be six doses, I've even heard seven doses. Uh, and that creates some issues for us in terms of at the end of the night, uh, we have extra doses on hand, we don't wanna make those uh, go to waste. And so doses is a, is a critical component to it. And then data, uh, data is something that uh, we have to share data with each other we have to see data coming from the federal and state, and then each health system, each speaker who's here has been showing data. And this is our dashboard that's actually a public dashboard 
And I want to point out a few things here. The first is looking at just the positivity rate. Uh, we're at 5.9% if you see in the bottom right hand corner, seven day average 5.9%. And as Nerali stated earlier, this is the likes of, of, of percentage that we haven't seen since, since the early, you know, right before the holidays, if you will. Uh, we, we got up to like 20% with our spectrum health data. So just think about the, the positivity rate where it was right at the holidays. We actually came up with messaging and said, hey, please stay home, please make your circle smaller. Uh, and it truly was remarkable. West Michigan did, did react to that. And uh, we got through the holidays and did not see a continuation of that surge that we were seeing right before the holidays. Um, also, you can see that in the top right-hand corner, we are now tracking how many vaccines are given, both first dose and second dose vaccines. Uh, and, we, and we update this every single day at 6 a.m. And it's public, so you can go on to spectrumhealth.org and take a look at it. Okay, so here's the rollout, basically. And what, what we're doing here is we are following the MDHHS uh, kind of guidelines with the CDC. And what you can see here is, um, as, as was pointed out before, we are kind of in that 1A into 1B phase, where we're looking at healthcare workers, long-term residents, et cetera. 1B starts then with the Michigander 65 and older, frontline essential workers, child care, pre-K, high school staff, and congregate care facilities. A couple things I want to point out about this. Remember, frontline essential workers, that definition is different than the definition that we had in the spring. So in the spring, when it was like, you know, essential health care work, uh, I'm sorry, essential workers can go back to work. Um, it seemed I, I do occupational health and it seemed that everybody was essential, right? No matter what business you were, well, I'm essential and, and, and we have to be back in work, which I understand that completely. But that definition in the spring is much different than the definition now. Um, the, uh, the second thing I'll, I'll say about this is that you can see in terms of the timeline itself, uh, we really were expecting kind of that 1B to go live at the end of January. It went live January 11th. Uh, and so we really were, you know, you talk about, you know, so I'm going to be very transparent about what's going well, what's not going well. Some of the, the miscommunication maybe that was happening, and we really had to pivot and, and, and really work hard to kind of open up to 1B when we really probably weren't ready. Uh, especially like in Kent County, where it's a very large county, right? Some of the smaller counties got through their 1As really, really fast. We certainly weren't through our 1As, so we are we are still finishing up 1A and getting into that 1B um, uh, timeline. Here's just kind of a close-up then of, of of kind of our eligibility. Um, uh, you know, again, phase 1A and then and then 1B. Uh, law enforcement. I think I, I want to give credit to Kent County, who really helped uh, to split up basically the teachers and law enforcement firefighters so that we're really coordinated as to who's vaccinating who. Uh, that, was a, that was a job well done. I wanna spend some time here. So um, vaccinate West Michigan. Uh, this is the, you know, as Nerali pointed out kind of in my bio, this is something that um, I personally believe that you would not see uh, in many places of the country. I used to live on the east side of the state. Uh, I used to live down south and um, you know, only in West Michigan uh, would we have a, a collaboration like this. So Vaccinate West Michigan is a, uh, a collaborative that has, has really started, you know, gosh, three months ago, where we were looking at how can we do this better together. So taking our badges off, putting them down, and saying to ourselves, we can be more efficient if we work together. And we also need to be communicating uh, in sync with each other. You can imagine if Spectrum Health is coming out with a communication about vaccine and maybe, you know, Ottawa County is saying something slightly different and maybe the intentions were good, but if it's slightly different, the confusion that that may cause uh, for patients. And so that really is our two goals is be efficient with operations and really come together and, and, and do communication. We have this beautiful website. It's actually crashed a few times. Again, want to give Kent County Health Department a ton of credit for this website. Uh, this really is, is a lot of their doing and allowing us to, to, to filter patients through there. Um, you can see vaccinatewestmichigan.com is the actual website itself. If you click in distribution, there's a, there's a link right there, distribution. Uh, this is how you can sign up for vaccine. Uh, so you can do it individually, number one. Uh, number two, if you're a business out there and you want to sign up, you know, let's say you're a, a child care uh, organization and you want to sign up your, um, your uh, employees, you can actually go to that vaccine distribution. You can sign in 
and there's a survey there and it will really ask you kind of like some things about your business itself, how many employees you have, that sort of thing. And then we take that in the background and, and we're just, we're keeping this list right now. Uh, and then when we get more vaccine, of course, we will, um, you know, coordinate then how we're going to get you vaccinated. But then also you can, you, can, you can sign up individually through your preferred health department, preferred health system, that sort of thing, which I'll talk about here in a second. Again, uh, we can't do this alone. Uh, I talked about putting our badges down. You can see all the different health partners here. And there's many more, by the way, that have been involved in this. Uh, again, only in West Michigan can you get a collaboration like this. Uh, it's not going on on the east side of the state. And I, I've not really heard of, of, of much collaboration going on elsewhere. Uh, so we're really proud of, of what we're doing here in West Michigan. I think all West Michigan residents really should be proud of this. Okay, a couple different things I want to talk about about the actual mechanics of getting vaccines in arms we talk about. So we have really two strategies. One is large scale clinics. And you can see pictures here. This is the uh, um, West Michigan Vaccine Clinic, which was announced two weeks ago at DeVos Place. So any of you who've been at DeVos Place, pretty large space, right? Um, also, it's on, it's on the bus line. So it's, it's centrally located, large space. It really fit a lot of the criteria we were looking for in terms of doing large scale clinics. You can see that big picture there on the right. Look at the scale of that. Uh, and that's just one bay, by the way. We can scale this and do multiple bays. And we have kind of goals of doing, you know, we could do upwards of 5,000 vaccines right here every single day. We have a goal at Spectrum of all of our, our clinics themselves doing about 50,000 uh, per week. You know, so again, if we're racing to herd immunity, which I will get to here in a second, this certainly is a key cog in our wheel. Uh, we also have the 60th Street, um, which, which um, was our first kind of mass scale clinic. The uh, West Michigan Vaccine Clinic uh, at DeVos Place is a collaboration with Kent County and Mercy. Been great partnerships. It's, it's awesome to see when you walk in there, you have the different uh, badges on and, and, and people are talking and collaborating. I can't say enough about how proud I am uh, to be part of this. Okay, so this is this is a, a key slide for me because I, I say this all the time. If the if the DeVos Place Clinic, the West Mich Michigan Vaccine Clinic, is kind of the easy button, and I say that because um, that's really for people who have uh, you know the the cell phones, uh, people that that can sign up through uh, you know the different my chart processes, uh, who have uh, access to cars and could get down to the vaccine clinic, right? Um, and that's, that is important work because to get to herd immunity, we need that, that mass vaccine, vaccination clinic. But I personally believe that we should be judged on this slide right here, which is how do we get vaccine to those that maybe don't have those means, maybe don't have the cell phones, maybe don't have cars or transportation, maybe have a reluctance to get vaccinated because of maybe our, our, our previous uh, history. Uh, you know, you think about like, uh, Black History and Tuske Tuskegee Experiment. Um, so I think we need to be judged on this slide right here. So we have a couple things that we're doing, partnering with the Kent County Health Department and other, uh, other health departments. We are taking basically vaccine to these communities. That way that they can feel confident. Uh, they, they don't have any of those uh, kind of barriers to get vaccine. We're trying to educate them as much as possible. Uh, we've done New Hope Baptist Church, Wyoming Senior Center, and we have plans to do many, many more especially under Nirali's uh, leadership. Connecting with the community. So this is all about education. And, and I wanna talk about you know, the curse of knowledge um, is what I call it. So you think about all these experts up here, right? And we talk about different things about herd immunity and, and you, you hear Dr. Jameson talk about all the science behind uh, the vaccine itself, right? We are constantly inundated with this as healthcare workers with this. Because of that, we have the curse of knowledge. Uh, and sometimes I think uh, as frustrating as, as people talk about like, you know, pandemic um, frustration, I think healthcare workers sometimes get frustrated with some of the negative media towards, you know, the vaccine itself. And so I, I will challenge all of our healthcare leaders to think about this for a second. When someone posts something on Facebook and, and you think, how can they, how can they absolutely think that? It's just because we have a different perspective because we have that knowledge, right? And, and because we have that knowledge, we think that everybody else has the same knowledge that we do. That's the curse of knowledge. So we have to listen to those uh, complaints, listen to uh, uh, their feelings about vaccine, 
listen to what people are just saying because they heard they heard something on the on uh, a friend say something or Facebook, et cetera. And so what we are trying to do is really educate, 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 listen and educate. And that's what this slide depicts here. Again, collaborating with our health department uh, leaders and our health system leaders. Uh, this is just a, uh, shows kind of Spectrum Health, kind of where our vaccine clinics are. Uh, through the West Michigan Vaccine Collaboration, we have actually a bigger map with all of the dots on there. It's not quite ready for prime time, so I didn't show it today, but you can see there 51,000 uh, first doses, 17,000 uh, second doses, and I think this is through about 48 hours ago. This is our scheduling process, and, and this really talks about, again, that easy button, right? So you have a cell phone, you can go through uh, the MyChart process. Metro has a, a similar process, so does Mercy. The health departments have their own processes. Uh, and I'll talk about some of the some of the challenges of that, but but this is kind of our easy button that you can get uh, vaccinated uh, in. This is a this is a good slide. I want I want people to think about this in generalities here for a second. Uh, we talked about herd immunity and the in the race to get herd immunity. And when you look at this slide here, basically, uh, that 60 percent. I want you to think of that as like the the herd immunity threshold. And I'm talking in generalities again, right? Meaning if we get more people vaccinated than not you could say that's herd immunity, right? With this particular disease though, we have to add certain factors to it. So this disease and how fast it transmits that are not right there is about 2.5 times the rate. If you factor in that, and then also the fact that we cannot vaccinate people under 16 years of age, then we have to reach a herd immunity of 75%. Now you factor in on the right hand of the slide, the new strain, the new or any new strain. We talked about, Dr. Jameson talked about the three new strains there. Well, let's just say if, if the R naught is 2.5, but then uh, this new strain is 1.5 times more trans, transmissible than the, the R naught, the original strain, then we're talking about a, a transmissible rate of 3.75, which increases then our herd immunity. And so this is not an exact science right now, but I want you to think in generalities, it speaks to, we have got to really get herd immunity as quickly as possible so that we can stop this in its tracks. And then so that new variants can't, can't form. And that's really the point of this slide. And this is it. Um, so key learning is about rolling this out. Over communicate, we got to make it simple. I think in the beginning, we were probably making it a little bit too complex on ourselves. Uh, one size doesn't fit all. We talked about the differences in terms of you know, you have the cell phone or you don't. We have to prioritize the most vulnerable. And I hope that we are all measured on how we do with that. Uh, we have to plan, but we have to be nimble. I think Nirali knows that and Pete and Andrew. And uh, we have to be nimble because things change um, pretty fast on a, on a daily, if not um, sometimes hourly basis. Community partnerships are key. We talked about that. And then we have to trust the process. So I, I hope everybody hears that we are working as hard as we can. Please trust us and we'll get vaccine in your arm as soon as we can. Thank you for having me and I'll turn it over back, to, back over to Nirali. Hey, thank you so much, Keith. So now I'd like to invite all the other panelists to turn their cameras back on. And unfortunately, Dr. Bagdasarian had an urgent meeting that she had to attend to, so she had to leave. And so for the audience, again, please, we ask that you use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for the panelists. And don't forget to include the panelists' names if you have a question intended for that specific person. We have quite a few questions, so I think there is no shortage of them. So we will do our best to get through some of these, but I, unfortunately, I don't think we'll have time to get through all of these questions. Um, so I'm gonna start just generalizing. There are a lot of questions that are in similar categories. So I'm gonna start with, um, this one I think I'll start with you, Dr. Jameson. But one of the questions is, has research on the vaccines determined if they reduce the risk of transmission? Uh, you know, it's actually mixed with that. Um, one of the ways you know that is by actually testing people uh, without symptoms if they've been vaccinated. So Johnson & Johnson actually came out with some recent data that showed that the number of people that had asymptomatic infection was a lot lower in the vaccinated community than in the non-vaccinated community. But outside of that, we don't really know uh, based on the data we have right now. We do think that it's possible that people can actually have an infection after getting vaccinated and be asymptomatic. Now, we don't know if they transmit it as easily. We don't know if they transmit it at all. Uh, our overall experience with vaccines is that in cases when people do get a vaccine, do get infected, they spread it a lot less easily and a lot less readily and their viral loads are lower if they've been vaccinated. So. Uh, I would say that I'm optimistic to say and to hope that uh, asymptomatic carriage and transmission will be lower if you've been vaccinated. 
Great. Thank you, Dr. Jameson. There are several questions that talk about the concern, um, the worry that people have about these vaccines affecting fertility, um, what information is there about pregnancy? I know some of you have mentioned this in your talks, but if you could talk a little bit more about that, I think that would be helpful for our audience. I can do that or other panel can too, who do you want? If you wanna get started and then we can, if others have more to add, that would be great. I think the big one is the effect on the placenta that's been kind of been talked about. This was first initiated by a Pfizer researcher who was last employed with Pfizer back in 2011. Um, and this came from the placenta and the spike protein carry a genetic similarity of a few base pairs. And so the concern was that if you give someone a spike protein vaccine, that you actually might have an immune reaction to the placenta as well. But the amount of similarity between those two is minuscule. And we also are lucky that we have uh, hundreds or uh, tens of millions of cases around the world of COVID-19 where pregnant women have been exposed to the spike protein from natural infection. And we have not had issues with infertility. We have not seen birth rates go down dramatically. Um, and we have not seen uh, an inability for individuals to get pregnant after they've had COVID. And so if, I, if, if we were going to see that kind of cross-reactivity, we'd actually see it with natural immunity as well as with vaccine. And so uh, while we don't use pregnant women in studies for vaccines, we know that we have not used pregnant women in studies for almost any vaccine trial in history. So uh, I think that, you know, the statements from the American College of Gynecology, ACOG, as well as the maternal fetal medicine societies have come out in strong condemnation of this and strongly support their patients uh, getting the vaccine. Any of the other panelists want to comment? No, uh, well said. Uh, Dr. Jameson. Okay, great. Uh, I would just refer others to the American College of uh, Gynecology and Obstetricians. I think they have extensive information that uh, goes into a lot of detail about kind of where the studies were done and where their position comes out from. But I think it's a strong statement that they've come out and recommended that, um, you know, to protect pregnant women from um, the really severe potential outcome from uh, COVID-19 that uh, pregnant women get the vaccine. There are several questions about the time frame between the two doses of the vaccine. How important is that time frame? Um, and then, if someone doesn't does not experience many side effects from the vaccine, is the vaccine still effective? Um, perhaps, Pete, if you want to start with that one, and then we can see if others have something else to add. Sure. You know, when we looked at the studies that were done on the vaccines, uh, there were uh, especially for there and there are differences between the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine for the interval. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine is recommended to be dosed every 21 days, and the Moderna vaccine every 28 days. Um, that uh, those were the optimal targets for to achieve the the highest level of efficacy. Uh, but the studies did have ranges within them uh, for patients that varied from that, and uh, the CDC has come out uh, in their clinical considerations and allowed for a grace period of up to four days before um, the 20, the twenty uh, first day, um, or up to as long as forty two days uh, for uh, the, the the second dose to be received from the first dose. So there is some variability that is allowed within the the. Um, uh, actual recommendations, um, which I think is outstanding and gives us more opportunity to make sure that we vaccinate more people within those timeframes. But the goal is really to still target the 21 day and 28 day intervals. Dr. Jamison, do you have anything else to add? I completely agree, and we're trying to shoot for that. Uh, it's just a lot of stuff we don't know right now. Johnson & Johnson's data they released on the second uh, in a Lancet preprint article did state that individuals that got a second dose, sorry, not, not Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, um, they stated that, dose, that, if, that when doses were delayed for the second dose, they actually had a more robust response uh, than if they got it at the four week mark as prescribed. So those that were delayed actually had a better immune response than those that were done right on the timeline. Um, so I think that we just don't know for sure. And so when you don't know for sure, you go with the, where the trials are. And for us, the trials are at the three and four week mark. And we're trying to do that, um, recognizing that there may be challenges and we're gonna have to do the best we can sometimes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And somewhat related, uh, several people have asked, if I've had COVID-19, should I still get the vaccine? I don't mind, I, I always yeah, have an opinion. <laughs> so uh, so the, the interesting thing about COVID-19 is that uh, a, there's two different types of immunity. There's immunity that comes from antibodies and immunity that comes from our cells. 
And uh, we know that mild infections sometimes only really trigger antibodies, which can actually tend to wane over time. That's why we've seen some cases of reinfection uh, in our communities. And one of the biggest risk factors is actually mild disease. The, the vaccines do a really nice job of kind of giving the immune system a, a jumpstart with antibodies. And then it follows that up with this booster, which really gives our body a memory for COVID-19. So that second dose, we feel like engages those memory cells better uh, in some cases than natural immunity does. So uh, the big, so the, the moral of the story is, if you had COVID-19, you've recovered from COVID-19, there's likely benefit from the vaccine for you. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, it, it's a it's a controlled vaccine, right? Like like you said, there's there's mild disease, there's severe disease, and so that's why we are recommending because we know exactly what dose you're getting and what your reaction should be. Um, the other thing I want to say really quick, Nirali, on that last question in terms of the, of the uh, 21 and 28 day dosage is something that I think has been tripping even healthcare workers up is that it's at least 21 and at least 28 days. I think uh, we have people who are like trying to get in even before the 21 and 28 days or, or trying to make sure it's on the 21st and 28th day. And um, it, it doesn't have to necessarily be right on those days. Uh, the point is that you get both the first and the, and the second split apart um, at least 21 and 28 days. Yeah, no, thanks for that clarification too. Um, Keith, this one's gonna be for you. We have several people asking, what are the best ways to register for the vaccine? What can employers do if they want to register their employees for this vaccine? Yep. So uh, I'll go back to what I said earlier. And just to review, if you go to vaccinatewestmi.com um, uh, under the distribute tab, you can go in there and you can actually sign up individually if you'd like. Um, so let's just say you're a Metro Health uh, patient and uh, on there, on that website, you can click on through, through their links and you can actually sign up there. Um, if you are an employee, I'm sorry, an employer who wants to vaccinate their employees, maybe you think that you're in 1B or 1C. We also have a, have a survey on that same distribution uh, website there. You can fill out the survey and then we are keeping that list. If we had vaccine, uh, we would be contacting a lot of people with, uh, with these businesses. We just don't have vaccine right now. And that's, that's the problem. And where, where I think the problem lies is um, just that the, the amount of production that has happened is kind of dried out. I'm hopeful though, um, as time goes on, that we'll kind of get that machine running and, and, and pretty soon we'll have, a, we'll have enough vaccine that a lot of these questions won't be coming at us anymore. And we'll just be vaccinating everybody um, all at once. But, but for now, we got to really um, take it you know, day by day, go sign up at, through that distribute um, vaccination website there. And again, can do it individually or through uh, an employer. Which, by the way, I'll say I'll say something else. If you get it individually and you've signed up both ways, that's okay, because we can't take an entire ward or an entire line uh, off work to go get vaccinated because of of what Dr. Jameson and Pete talked about, which was some of the side effects. Right? Uh, we heard uh, on the West Coast uh, uh, in the early days, people were giving the vaccine to like entire nursing units, and then they were all out for the next two days because of the side effects. Right. That rarely happens, but but it just shows you you have to be kind of smart with uh, if you if you're looking at it from an employer perspective. So having someone go ahead of time is abs absolutely okay. Great. Someone also asked, what happens if there are extra doses at the end of the day? Can people mm -hmm. sign up for those? Can people show up? If each of you could really address just briefly on what happens with those doses. I yeah, maybe. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Pete. Sure. Yeah. We can share it. <laughs> so I think all sites that have had experience with the vaccine clinics have run into this concern. So um, I know it, in our institutions, we create standby lists uh, every day to make sure that we have people that fall within the current priority list that may or may not have been able to get scheduled within the uh, official scheduling process um, or had trouble doing so. We also have uh, our physicians that are doing outreach into uh, vulnerable populations and um, places those individuals that again fall into the prior, current prioritization list from the state and from the federal government um, that are then put on the uh, standby list. And so at the end of the day, since these are multi-dose vials and they 
uh, the clock starts ticking on them, as I had mentioned, you know, that as soon as we've got them diluted and we've uh, entered the vial, we have six hours to use those syringes. Uh, we, don't, we don't want to waste a single dose uh, that is available for us to potentially vaccinate somebody. So we call those individuals on the standby list and let them know that you know, once we give them a call that uh, we'd like to have them come into our clinics within uh, 45 minutes if, if possible, and then we vaccinate. And very proud to say that um, our organization, and I believe most of the others in town here, uh, have not um, wasted any doses of vaccine um, and that every dose that we've had been made available because of the shortage we've been able to get into somebody's arm. Yeah, just just add to that really quickly and that is the, the topic of ethics, right? Um, we've got to be ethical with how we're distributing because of the shortage of vaccine. It, it, this is where we have to be really careful. It can't be there's vaccine left out, out over at the end of the day and the people who are working will call their family members and, and, and their, or their husbands or wives, right? The ethics of it is just what Pete said. We've got to call, we've ha got to have a list ready of people that, that fall into that criteria, that 1A or 1B. So we have a list um, and, and we, we've, we found out very early, I think our first night, in fact, that we had some extra doses and we worked through a process of that. For all those who are showing up at like the West Michigan Vaccine Clinic at DeVos Place at the end of the night, kind of hanging out like, oh, you know, Please don't, because uh, we have lists generated. Um, there really is no reason to do that, because again, ethically, we've got to we've got to continue going on. Who is most priority to get vaccine? Yeah, I totally agree with you guys. Uh, you know, our our calling list at the end of the day is made up of people from the priority that Dr. Bora has given us from the health department. So we're using that to kind of catch up with some of our uh, teachers that are straggling um, and uh, some of our other priority groups uh, like federal law enforcement. That's how we got them through is actually through some of those uh, last uh, second call lists. So I would completely echo that we are we are absolutely following the tiering and we are not jumping ahead with those extra doses. We're making sure that our callback lists are comprised of individuals that would meet criteria from MDHHS standards. I think we're all trying to meet those, but there are definitely instances when that doesn't happen. Right. So I'm sure you've heard of those, um, but it, it does happen. So this next question is really a good one because I think I hear it a lot. I'm sure all of you hear it a lot. And I'm going to open up to all of you. Um, it says people are so worried about unknown long-term effects of the COVID-19 vaccine. Since it is an mRNA virus, would the possible long-term effects from the vaccine be the same as possible long-term effects of actually having COVID-19? Maybe Andrew, if you want to get started and then we'll have others chime in. Yeah, so I would say that um, uh, the, the answer to the last question is actually no. So there's probably not the same kind of long-term effects you'd see from the vaccine versus from the actual infection itself. Um, the, the mRNA vaccine is just a fragment of a, of a genetic piece of the virus. So it only codes for that one little uh, protein called the spike protein. Um, the, I think that it is fair to be worried about possible long-term effects because we just don't know. We can't say that for sure. But in Moderna's case, uh, and also with Pfizer's, with BioNTech's case, they've been using this messenger RNA technology for other uh, vaccines, for immunotherapies, and for uh, human-based interventions for over a decade. So this is not a new technology in general. This is a new technology for vaccines. And we have not seen autoimmune uh, issues. We have not seen long-lasting infects. We've not seen things that have popped up years down the road um, in those other cases. Uh, and so I'm reasonably optimistic. And it's why I had zero hesitance for myself getting the vaccine. And when I can actually get my wife and kids in, uh, if they meet criteria, um, I will have zero hesitance getting them in as well. Yeah, just to add to that, um, you know, I think um, for the most, I'm going to speak in generalities again, for the most part, uh, vaccine side effects occur uh, very early on, uh, very rarely, you know, do you have latent effects of, of vaccines? That's first thing. Second thing is, you know, getting back to kind of where the, the mistrust of vaccine started in the first place. And remember, it was the, the uh, 1998, the, the large uh, or the trial um, regarding the MMR vaccine linked to autism. And, and I just want to remind everybody that, that all that evidence that was presented at the time where, where this negative vaccine uh, uh, connotation came uh, was, a, was, was, was found to be fraudulent and the, and the person who, who generated that you know served time in jail maybe is still in jail uh, because of that uh, uh, and just to say this you know vaccines are the single most um, greatest public health healthcare 
uh, initiative that we have. It's completely eliminated diseases. I've seen, you know, polio patients who survived polio and that just a horrible disease. And, and we, we had a vaccine that eliminated that completely. Um, and, and again, this is maybe where the curse of knowledge comes in. I have that knowledge, but I hope you're hearing me that, that certainly this particular disease, if you get this disease, there are, there are long-term ramifications of that are much higher than if you take this vaccine. The only the other thing I'd add is I think from the technology standpoint, um, as Dr. Jameson pointed out, uh, we were talking about a very small fragment of basically a piece of code uh, that really utilizes our own body's natural protein generation capabilities to produce this uh, spike protein to teach our body without having to go through the actual infection process of the virus, which um, uh, replicates at a geometric rate inside of the body, creating a much, much higher um, level of potential dis uh, tissue disruption uh, in, a, in an enormously safer way. Uh, the messenger RNA uh, uh, material is very quickly degraded within the uh, inside of the cell. It never enters the nucleus of the cell and does not interact with the D uh, pa person's patient's DNA in any way um, and is very quickly degraded after our ribosomes, which are the component of our cellular kind of engineering that produce the protein um, destroyed. So it, it does not hang around long at all within our bodies. And so the, as the memory component that Dr. Jameson spoke about is really the important part. It primes our body to be able to respond when we naturally run into the virus uh, so that we are able to quickly attack it and uh, completely or eliminate its ability to hopefully replicate in our body and create those really destructive side effects that you hear about people ending up in the, in, in the ICUs and unfortunately uh, sometimes ending up with death. So um, I, I agree completely with the, my other panelists that the, the vaccine you know, is the way to help make sure that we, we help more of us to survive and be protected and protect those that have trouble protecting themselves. Thank you. And we only have a few minutes left. We do have quite a few questions on equity, and I want to make sure we get a chance to touch on these a little bit. Um, one question we received was that, will the state um, MDHHS COVID vaccine dashboard include race and ethnicity? And so I know Dr. Bagdasirian had to leave, but um, at this point, it does not include that information, but there is a plan to have that up soon. So we are looking forward to that. Someone else did ask if Kent County Health Department is tracking equity. We are trying, but again, it's because of the lack of that data. Um, this is different than COVID uh, testing data, so we don't have as easy access to the race and ethnicity. Each health system does have that information. We are working to compile that data so we can better make strategies to make sure we're addressing equity. Um, someone also asked if each group, if each person could just really briefly share what you're doing for equity. Um, and I can, if there's time, I'll share health department, but I'd like to have each of you share briefly on that. I'd like to just to take a moment to recognize the work that Dr. Bora has done herself. Um, all of us on the West Michigan Vaccine Collaborative have met recently and spoke specifically on projects of how do we continue to uh, outreach into our communities and uh, um, find ways for us to break down those barriers and get vaccine into those arms of those individuals that um, are at risk. And the, the work, um, as I think you heard Key say, I think is somewhat unique to West Michigan and the, our ability to really partner um, and try to make sure that we uh, reach every one of these at-risk regions um, and not overlap or duplicate efforts so that we can get more vaccine into arms quickly. So i just like to recognize you, Dr. Bora, for the work that you've done in leading us on that. Big team. We have a big team at the health department that is really passionate, so it's not just me. I would just echo that as the coordination, you know, um, and uh, and equity also includes equity in terms of technology access, equity in terms of mobility access, and things like that. So we are. Uh, I, I'm I'm really really proud to be part of. Uh, this panel, because these individuals that are here are, are people we talk to every week. You know, we're all on we're we're on conversations um, all the time. And even before we started here, you know, I was texting with people that, that are a part of this team, saying, "How are we going to get this next group of people in?" And so, I, what I would just say is. Uh, this is a huge priority for Kent County, is a huge priority for all of our health systems in Kent County. And so I would ask for uh, a little bit of trust and patience. At St. Mary's, we're not amazing at kind of putting some of our stuff out in the public. And so a lot of the things we do are kind of behind the scenes or using community health workers to dive into neighborhoods and to kind of go 
to the root of where we know we have connections. Um, and that doesn't always get out there and it's not a public facing kind of ability to, to schedule. That's one of the things we're good at and we are, are proud of that. But then what we do is leverage what other people's strengths are as well. Uh, you know, leveraging DeVos to kind of get that big number that you can't get when you go small. Um, and so it, it is a huge community effort. Um, and I and I completely echo what Keith was saying. We have to be proud, and I am very proud to see what we can do in West Michigan when we do it together. Just quickly, uh, um, completely agree with both of you, and and just to say, the the DeVos Place West Michigan Clinic allows us to pivot now, and and really start to focus. I think the West Michigan Vaccine Collaborative is now going to be focused on on this. And I talked about how we need to be judged not by DeVos Place, but by this. And um, I'm, I'm really proud of, of what Nirali is doing. Um, just some details, uh, you know, she's already gathering data of, of where we should be going, you know, what, what parts of Kent County uh, and, and that work, it, it's gonna become its whole separate body of work uh, that we're really gonna be partner, partnering not only with Kent County, but, you know, Grahai for one, uh, Latino communities, it's, it's really those partnerships beyond the health systems where we can really get with um, leaders in those communities and, and, and have them understand and educate them and make sure they're okay with, with the evidence and the science. And then they can educate their peers. I mean, it has to be that type of a collaboration. And I have no doubts that, you know, in collaboration with Nirali, we're going to get it done. I think we're fortunate that we've had all these partnerships starting from the beginning of COVID. So it's been since March that we've been talking to all yeah. of these community leaders, these community groups. So we don't have to start from scratch and building our connections. And so we're right. lucky to have community organizations and partners that truly care about their communities and want to do the best. And they're busy people. They have families and jobs and they're taking extra time to really do this work with us. So could not do this without them. So very grateful. Um, any last comments that you, any of you want to share? Just kind of to echo what we just talked about, even today, um, even with the weather going on today, there are vaccination cl clinics that are live and open today. Um, there are outreach um, clinics that are happening today that um, we have partnership with, um, again, as members on the West Michigan Vaccinate with Ottawa County, and they are being very active uh, in the last couple of days here with really doing a lot of outreach into our uh, independent senior living facilities that are in that, um, in that general location. Um, as, as I know, all of the other systems that are um, uh, as a part of this. So I just want everybody to know that this is a full-time 24-7, 365 job right now for all of us to continue to work on uh, getting vaccine into the public. And I'm very proud to be part of the, the group of uh, how much effort we've put together already. And I, I believe, with, again, with the continued improvement in vaccine supply, that we are going to be able to hit the, both our, our state and our national targets. Uh, I'll just two two words come to mind: um, hope and patience. So hope that the vaccine is here, um, but also patience because I think you know we we've done a great job of kind of media blitz: the vaccines here, vaccines here, right? And now we're saying, well, it's here, but when am I when am I going to you know this is going to be a multiple months, you know? So just remain patient. Don't get greedy. And you know, I I know of some people who are who are signing up for vaccine in multiple states, just we're going to get to you. Just be patient. Just realize that it, once we get vaccine, we will get it up and running. You saw the you saw all the clinics that we have going. So it's just a matter of getting vaccine. So for now, just be patient. Um, continue with all the, the measures that we put in place prior to vaccine. Uh, and then very soon, hopefully, we'll be out of this pandemic altogether. All right. Thank you. Andrew, any last words? OK. Nope, so. You know, unfortunately, it's time to conclude today's event. We want to thank our panelists for their participation and for their, for their presentations and their answers to our questions. We also thank the audience for taking part in today's health forum and definitely to Dr. Nagelkirk and the staff that's made this a really wonderful experience for all of us. So the next health forum will be held on March 5th at 8 a.m. And it will focus on the impact that COVID-19 has had on our educational institutions, including K through 12 and higher education. The registration is open for that event and can be found on the Health Forum website. Announcements for this event will be going out very soon. Again, thank you for coming and have a great weekend.